The last 24 hours have witnessed important events both on the ground in Israel and Palestine and in Gaza and also in terms of diplomatic activity with the first of what I am confident will be a series of resolutions passed by the UN General Assembly. I've been discussing the probability that we would get to the General Assembly eventually, and yesterday, finally, we did. But let's first turn to the situation on the ground, because here I have to say there's been considerable fog of war. Firstly, yesterday, as I discussed in my previous video, we had at the start of the day the dramatic news of US um, airstrikes upon positions allegedly of the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps of Iran in Syria, warnings by the United States towards against Syria, reports of the arrival in Israel and in the Middle East of 900 operators of air defense missile systems from the United States. There have also, by the way, been many reports of flights of American transport aircraft to the Middle East, apparently carrying advanced air defense missiles, um, Patriot missiles and THAAD missiles, um, which are going to be positioned in the Middle East. And we also had, frankly, confusing information about the final destination point of the USS Eisenhower and its task force, carrier task force. Firstly, as I discussed in one of my recent programs, there were reports that it had been repositioned, it was going to be repositioned to the Red Sea from the Eastern Mediterranean. Then yesterday, we got reports over the course of the day from various unofficial sources that it was going to be sent to the Persian Gulf, which would, of course, have brought it very close to Iran indeed and would have been a profoundly disturbing act had that actually been the case. But anyway, over the course of yesterday, what appeared to be more more reliable reports suggested that it would be deployed in the Eastern Mediterranean as well. So the Eisenhower will be joining the Gerald Ford in the Eastern Mediterranean. Both carrier groups are going to be sent there. And there is logic in this. As I've said previously, deploying the Eisenhower to the Red Sea would not have placed it beyond range of Kinjal missiles launched by Russia. The Russians might not have been able to launch Kinjal missiles against the uh, um, uh, Eisenhower from the Black Sea, but the MiG-31 fighter jets that are the launch carrier from these missiles can equally well operate above the Caspian Sea and can launch their missiles from there, and that would pl place them well within range of the Eisenhower in the Red Sea. Now, that, of course, always assumes that the Russians would want to attack these two Navy carriers. I'm sure that they don't. I'm sure that this was more um, a case of the Russians giving warnings um, in order to deter American airstrikes upon Russian positions in Syria. But anyway, if there'd been any plan, any idea of positioning the Eisenhower in the Red Sea in order to place it out of range of Kinjal missiles, I'm sure that somebody figured out very quickly that um, that couldn't happen. And of course, placing the Eisenhower in the Persian Gulf would not only have been extremely provocative, indeed, but would have placed the Eisenhower within range of Iranian missiles. Now, 
perhaps those missiles would, which are surely significantly less sophisticated than the Kinjal missiles that the Russians have, perhaps those missiles would not be capable of penetrating the air defense screen around, which is always created around US Navy carriers. But it would still be putting the Eisenhower um, potentially in harm's way. And to my mind, that makes that would have made little, little sense. It would have been an incredibly provocative thing to do and also potentially a dangerous one. So positioning the Eisenhower in the Red Sea, oh, sorry, in the Eastern Mediterranean makes sense. It means that there's now two Navy carriers going to be deployed in the Eastern Mediterranean. I've seen some reports that say that there's going to be 11, as many as 11 Aegis class Arleigh Burke destroyers operating in this general area. These are very powerful warships capable of launching uh, Tomahawk cruise missiles and with very advanced air defense systems. There's apparently also Ticonderoga class cruisers in the area. I am not fully familiar with every detail of US military deployments. And I have to say that there's also been some um, wrong reporting about this. But one way or the other, the naval buildup is massive. And for the moment, at least, it looks like it is being concentrated in the Eastern Mediterranean, though it also seems to be the case that some uh, American warships are positioned um, close to the Arabian Peninsula uh, in the Red Sea and off the coast of Yemen and such places. So huge American deployments, eventually a certain amount of clarification about the movements of the Eisenhower and, as I said, a massive offensive, potentially offensive punch being created by the United States in the Eastern Mediterranean. And, of course, we also had those reports a couple of days ago about those other two US Navy carriers being deployed as well. And, of course, we don't know where they're going and where they will be positioned and what they're intended to do. But, of course, if they join the existing forces in the Middle East, then, as I've discussed in previous programmes, we are talking about a simply colossal build-up. Now, yesterday, over the course of my programme, I drew attention to some of the parallels of what happened in August 1964, at the time when the Gulf of Tonkin resolution was passed by Congress, and what is happening today. I pointed out that some of the events leading up to the Gulf of Tonkin resolution and some of the language resemble some of the language and some of the events that we see today. So in both cases, we had purported attacks on forward positioned American military assets to destroyers in the case of the events in the Gulf of Tonkin. American bases in Syria this time. Details of both of these attacks are very sketchy, even in relation to the events in the Gulf of Tonkin, even to this day. There were immediate retaliatory airstrikes after each of these somewhat somewhat um, you know, sketchily described and, frankly, somewhat ineffective attacks on these American assets. We had strong warnings from the United States and eventually, of course, in the case of the Gulf of Tonkin incident, we saw, following a huge American build-up, 
an actual American commitment direct to direct action in the war in Vietnam, which is, well, we haven't got there yet in terms of the current crisis. Now, I, I have to say that there is one glaring difference between the situation then and the situation now. Uh, back in the early 1960s, the president, President Johnson, actually did approach Congress and Congress did authorize a joint resolution of a, a joint resolution, which is, of course, the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, which thereafter, by the way, became the basis upon which the US government claimed that it had authority from Congress to conduct operations right through the entire course of the Vietnam War. So Congress was involved. This time, there is no sign of that. And I have to say, I find this really extraordinary. We're seeing, we are in the process of seeing what is surely the biggest single American military build-up since the attack on Iraq in 2003. I, I suspect that in some respects this current concentration of force is potentially even bigger in terms of naval assets at least. And I would have thought that some people, the people in Congress, would be worried about it and concerned about it, and would be contacting the White House and asking the White House what exactly is going on, and would be saying to the White House, at the very least, that they require some explanation, perhaps some high-level briefings to take place, top US officials to come to Congress to explain exactly what the purpose of this colossal build-up is. Well, no doubt briefings of some kind are taking place. Probably these are uh, secret and confidential. But overall, there does seem to be an astonishing lack of curiosity and, dare I say, complacency, both within Congress and in the media in the United States about what this enormous build-up might point to. There's a book that has appeared fairly recently about the origins of the First World War, and I don't want to drive these parallels too far. But anyway, the title of this book, with which, by the way, I'm not in full agreement, at least with its content, but that's another story. Anyway, the title of the, war, of the book is The Sleepwalkers. The suggestion being that the great powers, the European great powers, in 1914 bas basically drifted into a world war without fully understanding the importance or the nature of the decisions that they were taking. Well, as I said, I'm not entirely convinced that that is true about what happened in 1914. But in terms of sleepwalking, I do sometimes wonder whether people in Congress or in the media in the United States are wide awake. Certainly, if I was in Congress or in the media in the, in, in the United States, at this time, I would be asking much more pointed questions about what is going on. And I would certainly suggest that by this point, at least, Congress ought to be taking steps. And given that it has the constitutional authority in the United States to declare war, it is Congress that ought to be pressing the administration, not just for a secret explanation, secret briefings about what is happening, but for public briefings as well, and 
perhaps even for some sort of vote to authorise these deplo deployments and to give us some idea as to what their purpose is. But anyway, that's, that's Congress, that's these American deployments. And what Alex Christoforou and I said in a programme a couple of days ago, that it looked to us as if the big Israeli operation in Gaza was being delayed until these big deployments, these big American deployments, were completed with all forces in place. Well, that is increasingly becoming, I won't say conventional wisdom, but I notice that more and more people are now starting to say it. Now, given the scale of these deployments, given the fact that two more carrier groups have only just set sail, given that it obviously or presumably takes time for missiles, air defence missiles, to be brought into operation across the Middle East. Given all of these things, it could very well be that the United States will not be fully ready for whatever it is that it is planning for several weeks. It could be that it will take several weeks before all of the assets that the United States needs are fully in place. That is, if you accept the premise that um, the deployments, all of these deployments, are being conducted according to some sort of plan. And if you also accept the further premise that the major Israeli ground offensive in Gaza is being held back until all of these assets are put in place, which it seems to me is possible, then you can understand the intense difficulty that the government of Israel is under, because they have been telling people in Israel that they're going to launch their ground offensives in Gaza for ever since the events of the 7th of October and weeks have now passed, um, almost three weeks have now passed since those events in Gaza, in fact exactly three weeks have passed since those events in Gaza and it could be that several more weeks will be needed before the United States completes its deployments, and many people in Israel have become unsurprisingly, increasingly critical, and there have been lots of rumours that there have been splits and divisions and arguments within the Israeli government and between the Israeli government and the military. And there were reports, some days ago that there were divisions within Israel's cabinet and there were further reports a few days ago that um, there was a there were arguments between Prime Minister Netanyahu and his generals the generals the military leadership in Israel apparently furious about what happened on the 7th of October determined to inv avenge the events of the 7th of October, also very worried that if the events of the 7th of October do, are left unanswered, that will somehow weaken Israel's reputation as the preponderant military power in the Middle East and that it will, uh, that, that will invite further attacks upon Israel. And so these massive demands on the part of the military supposedly for action to be taken against Gaza. I have to say that these reports are plausible, but they do contradict other reports which were which appeared in the 
US media um, shortly before, which I found equally plausible, which claimed on the contrary that it was the pol political leaders, Prime Minister Netanyahu and the civilians in his cabinet, who were pressing the military to start an offensive in Gaza, but the military were reporting back that the civilians were underestimating the difficulty and complexity of the operation that they were being asked to carry out. So anyway, put aside the question of which of these reports is true, talk of dissension in Israel. And inevitable, that is inevitable, given the continuing delays. So, what does Israel do in light of the fact that it's under pressure, apparently, from the United States to delay its ground offensive in Gaza. All kinds of explanations have been given as to why that is so, but overall, it does seem to me that this is likely responding to pressure from the United States. Well, it seems to me that what Israel does in this kind of situation, in order to square the circle, in order to calm public opinion in Israel and to paper up, paper over whatever cracks might be appearing within the Israeli cabinet and between the Israeli cabinet and the military is to authorise more limited military operations in Gaza, which nonetheless are of an extremely powerful nature and which can be made to appear as Israel taking decisive action to fight Hamas in Gaza. And I am going to suggest that that is what we have seen over the last 24 hours. Now, yesterday, over the course of yesterday, and indeed starting from the night before, reports were pouring in of a massive Israeli attack on Gaza of tanks and infantry fighting vehicles and large numbers of troops pouring into Gaza and it was indeed the case that bombing of Gaza had intensified to levels greater than any we have seen since the events of the 7th of October. And I read many reports pouring out from all sorts of places um, in the um, especially, I have to say, on the internet, saying that this was the big event. This is the moment when Israel finally had launched its great offensive in Gaza. And, of course, this followed some hours after a very, very strong speech from Prime Minister Netanyahu, which also appeared to give the impression that the big attack on Gaza was finally underway. And then the day continued, and the attack also continued, and it continued over the course of the night, but then we began to get more and more reports from Israel, this time looking like they're coming from official sources, telling us that this is not, in fact, the big offensive against Gaza, that this is more of a raid, that... Israel is trying to enlarge the area of operations in the north of Gaza. Again, not at all clear what that means exactly. It's not clear, for example, that Israel, for the moment, is trying to occupy any parts of Gaza City. But anyway, that this is a, an operation of that nature, that it is not the big ground assault that is still in the process of being prepared and has not yet happened. And there's been much discussion about why this might be the case. If it, First of all, there's some people who deny that it is the case. And we have reports from people who are either connected to Hamas or allied with Hamas or who are part of Hamas, who claim that, in fact, what has actually happened is that the Israelis did launch a great ground attack on Gaza yesterday, but that Hamas successfully repelled it. And there's been talk about six Cornet 
at anti-tank missiles having been launched, at least two or perhaps more Merkava tanks having been destroyed. There's apparently even a picture, a photograph, which supposedly shows one of these tanks. And it's apparently true that um, Hamas itself and its ally, Islamic Jihad, did launch a lot more rockets into Israel over the course of yesterday. And it seems that rocket attacks took place against Tel Aviv and Ashkelon and other places. But anyway, if you want to assume, if you want to accept Hamas's account of what happened, there was this big attack by Israel. Israel did attempt to launch its offensive, but Hamas, Hamas was able to repel that offensive. Now, I'm going to say straight away, I am not on the ground. I do not know exactly what is going on. Neither Hamas nor Israel, um, the Israeli leadership, are briefing me about what is what they're doing. And there aren't on the front lines the interesting and useful reporters, war reporters, of the sort that we find on both sides in the Ukraine war, who are able to provide us with all sorts of information, explaining what is going on and making it possible, at least to some extent, to reconstruct events and to get a feel for what is actually happening. But I'm going to suggest that what happened yesterday more probably falls within the explanation that I have just floated. The Israeli government, under intense political pressure, back home, needs to reassure its military and its people that it is, in fact, taking action. And so we had a major Israeli attack on Gaza. We saw heavy bombing. We saw use of ground troops. There were exchanges of fire with Hamas. But I don't get the impression that Israel actually made a serious effort to break through into Gaza City, to capture any part of uh, Gaza City, or do anything of that kind. I think that undoubtedly Israel does want to cause damage to Hamas. And we've seen the media suddenly fill with all sorts of pictures that purport to show, you know, the sketches and plans of parts of this elaborate tunnel network. We, we even have an account from Israel, or at least it appears to originate from Israel, and the, which supposedly shows the location and of Hamas's central headquarters, positioned in all kinds of very elaborate and complex tunnels located under a hospital building. Um, I have to say, the tunnel network and the bunkers that are shown here seem to me so elaborate and so sophisticated that I am <laughs> frankly skeptical that they can possibly exist on this sort of scale. But then, what do I know? Anyway. So we had all of this, and we had reports that um, Israel has used these heavy bombs and that they penetrated parts of the bunker network and tunnel network, and that 150 bunkers and tunnels have been destroyed. Again, unclear where that has happened, and there seems to be great vagueness for the moment about the detail. But anyway... We've had all of those reports from Israel. So this is, it seems to me, a case of Israel giving these descriptions, providing its people with information and the pictures of Israeli aircraft and Israeli troops actually engaged in some sort of massive operation and of course the Israelis this 
is useful in political terms because it fills the gap until the Americans arrive and are in position and the true operation can begin. And of course for Hamas as well, it also serves its purposes because it can then publish its contrasting reports that Israeli attacks have been repelled. What is continuing to happen, of course, is that we have the bombing and the missile attacks, all of those continue. People are being killed. And here I will say, and it's a point actually that I made some days ago in a program or touched on it, that the figures that are coming about civilian casualties in Gaza and which are published by the Gaza Ministry of Health. Of course, the Gaza Ministry of Health is controlled by Hamas, which is the political power in control of Gaza. Uh, many people assume that that must mean that these figures are completely wrong, entirely invented by Hamas. I am never repeating them myself, partly because I do think that questions about them do exist. But I would point out that there are many NGOs and humanitarian organisations that have presence in Gaza. The United Nations, up to very recently, has had a presence in Gaza. And to some extent at least, or so it seems to me, they've been corroborating some of these figures about um, um, civilian casualties, or at least they have been confirming that civilian casualties have indeed been taking place. And one of the most ominous and disturbing developments is that over the last couple of hours, the Israeli authorities have been taking steps to disconnect the internet and other means of communication from uh, between Gaza and the outside world. So there's now apparently steps being taken to also block use of mobile phones there. There's even been some reports that Israeli soldiers confiscate mobile phones from Gazan residents when they do come across them. But anyway, I can't help but think that this is partly intended to choke off that... Um, information flow from Gaza as the situation in Gaza in humanitarian terms deteriorates as more and more casualties appear um, uh, in order to prevent pictures of people being taken to hospitals and all of those things after Israeli bombing raids um, to prevent information which could be seen as corroborating some of the claims from the Gazan Ministry of Health, and also, of course, to suppress or to at least ensure that we don't see so many pictures or films or get so many detailed accounts of the effect of the food and water and fuel blockades of Gaza, which were imposed directly after the events of the 7th of October, and which have never been relaxed to any significant degree. Now, I'm going to suggest that before very long, this attempt to close off information, if I'm getting this correctly, I suspect that before very long, we're going to see um, that becoming a political issue in itself, a major international issue in itself. And I would also add that I think that the danger this policy runs is that some information is going to leak out of Gaza. It always does. There's always going to be some means that for information to come through, trying to block off sources of independent information, actually 
will increase Hamas's ability to control the information flow. And of course, it will also probably intensify and exacerbate rumors about the about what is actually going on in Gaza and conceivably this could even eventually backfire it could might it might it might even make for a situation where the reports from Gaza are about describe start to describe an even worse humanitarian situation than the one which is actually taking place. But anyway, that is what this is, seems to me is all about. So I suspect, as I said, that we're still some weeks away, probably, from the big offensive. I mean, this is, as one, you, you will all understand, I'm to some extent speculating now. I don't, as I said, have information about the various plans. In terms of Gaza itself, despite the attempts of various people to persuade me otherwise, including some very well-informed people who I take very seriously, I'm not entirely convinced that there is a clear plan. But anyway, despite, um, despite all of that, um, I suspect that we're probably going to be Despite, despite people not sharing their plans with me, if they have them, I suspect that this is going to take some weeks before we see the really big events in Gaza taking place. And I think we're still at a relatively early point in this crisis. Now, that's the situation on the ground. Some speculations on my part about the reasoning behind Israeli actions um, and about the timing of events. But I hope I've shown that this is informed speculation. And uh, to be honest, I think that most of what one is reading at the moment in the media or hearing on the, hearing on the media is speculation also. It's speculation which doesn't seem to me to be grounded on very much fact. Anyway, that's where we are with the situation on the ground, or at least as I can see it. Yesterday, something else happened, and um, it was important in itself, but it was a precursor of something more important. I have been discussing, at some length, the moves and counter-moves that have been happening at the level of the Security Council uh, in the United Nations. And I have been saying that the United States has been um, on the defensive there. It's been seeing its position in the Security Council itself erode. And sooner or later, there would also be an application for a resolution made to the UN General, General Assembly. And in fact, finally, or rather for the first time, that happened yesterday. And it took the form of a resolution proposed by all of the Arab states. I believe every single Arab state jointly proposed this resolution. And the resolution carried now, for a resolution to pass the General Assembly, it needs to have the support of two-thirds of the member states of the United Nations. This particular resolution got 120 votes, and 59 states either voted against it, in fact, 14 voted against it, and 45 abstained. So, it only just passed. It did manage to pass, but it only just passed. And that shows that before we get to the eventual point 
of a much stronger, much more powerful resolution. One that might conceivably even approach the point of a resolution under the Uniting for Peace formula. There is still an awful lot of diplomatic activity of mobilization, in other words, political mobilization across the global south and in Europe, which needs to be made. Having said this, this first resolution is a bad sign for the United States. It suggests the direction that global opinion is taking, and it is showing that um, support is now peeling away from the United States and Israel in the United Nations, and that we are gradually, step by step, getting closer to that point when either the Security Council passes a ceasefire resolution and the United States either is obliged to vote for it or abstains, or in the alternative, such a resolution is then taken to the General Assembly and is passed under the Uniting for Peace formula. Now, why do I say that the United States position is weakening? Well, it was interesting that only 14 states, which included Britain and the United States, voted against this resolution. Israel, of course, also voted against this resolution. Austria and Hungary and Croatia voted against the resolution as well. But notably, France voted for the resolution and other, and other US allies chose to abstain. And that was interesting because this resolution, as it was originally formulated, was much closer in spirit to the resolution, the very first resolution that the Russians proposed to the UN Security Council than the subsequent resolutions, that subsequent draft resolutions proposed to the Security Council by Russia and Brazil. Now, that very first Security Council resolution that the Russians put before the Security Council, their, their first draft, called for an immediate and sustainable ceasefire, called for humanitarian relief to be allowed into Gaza, supported, um, called for the immediate unconditional release of hostages, but did not condemn Hamas. It did not refer to the, to the actions that Hamas had taken on the 7th of October. Now, the Russians explained that by saying that they had avoided direct criticism of Hamas in the resolution, not because they didn't condemn what Hamas had done, but because they wanted a depoliticized, as they put it, resolution that would win over the maximum amount of support and which might logically have some chance of gaining acceptance and support from Hamas. So that was the reason that the Russians gave. Well, the United States voted against the Russian draft, vetoed the Russian draft and got most of the states on the Security Council to agree with it. They either voted against it or abstained, precisely because the res precisely on the grounds that the resolution did not condemn Hamas. And then, as I've discussed previously, we've had two further draft resolutions to the Security Council. One proposed by Brazil, which is clearly coordinating closely with Russia. One um, proposed again by the Russians, which did condemn Hamas, but which also called for a ceasefire 
humanitarian relief supply into Gaza and release of hostages. Now, importantly, the resolution that passed yesterday in the General Assembly reverts to the original Russian formula. It also calls for a ceasefire. Now, it uses careful language. It doesn't use the word ceasefire. This was clearly done to make it easier to win over support from countries in Europe. It doesn't actually specifically refer to a ceasefire, but it refers to a long-term durable humanitarian pause. So it uses the word pause, but it by inserting, by including the words long-term and durable, it is also clearly signalling that this is not going to be just a brief pause, but in effect a ceasefire. So it says that. It also, of course, calls for the release of the hostages and it calls for the opening of humanitarian relief supplies to Gaza. It also importantly says that Israel's demand that the population of northern Gaza move to southern Gaza, that that should be quashed, that that should be cancelled. So all of that, we've seen that in these draft resolutions before. But it does not. It did not condemn Hamas. It did not refer to Hamas. It did not make statements about the events on the seventh of October, just as the first Russian draft put to the Security Council did not say anything about Hamas. So this resolution that was passed by the General Assembly yesterday also does not specifically refer to or criticise Hamas. Now, the Western powers, Canada to be precise, proposed an amendment to the resolution which would have inserted into the resolution criticism of Hamas. The Canadian proposal was countered in a widely applauded speech by the ambassador of Pakistan. Pakistan, of course, the one Muslim power, Islamic power, Islamic state, that possesses nuclear weapons. And a country which is also, of course, a long-standing and traditional ally of the United States and of the West. Anyway, the ambassador of Pakistan rejected or criticised the Canadian proposal. He said, we've gone for a depoliticised resolution. Why do you constantly bring up the things that Hamas has, has done? Why don't you also talk about what Israel is doing? We're here to protect all civilians. And in light of this, we need to pre preserve some degree of balance. And that means that we are not going to name either party. Now, that is an astonishing thing to say. Um, and of course, given what happened on the 7th of October, entirely understandably, it has caused deep offence and anger in Israel. But the key point to say is that the Pakistani ambassador's words received very wide support within the General Assembly. The Canadian amendment was rejected and the resolution passed and passed without making any criticism of Hamas. Now, the Israelis, as I said, unsurprisingly, are deeply upset by this resolution. The Israeli ambassador to the, to the United Nations has said that by 
passing a resolution of this kind, one which didn't condemn Hamas and didn't condemn terrorism, the United Nations has, in effect, lost legitimacy. I understand why people in Israel may think that, but look at the geopolitical realities. France voted for the resolution. It said that it had doubts about the, the resolution because it didn't uh, criticize Hamas, but France broke with the other Western states by voting for this resolution. And other Western states, like Germany, for example, abstained. Only 14 countries actually voted against the resolution. When the Russian proposed draft, the one that also did not criticize Hamas, was placed before the Security Council, all the Western states on the, on the Security Council voted against the Russian draft. Now, one important Western state, France, is supporting a resolution in the General Assembly, which is very close to the Russian draft. The language differs, but the substance essentially is the same. And instead of voting against it and making clear their strong disagreement with it by doing so, other allies of the United States of Israel chose to abstain. We could see that the, that the tide is, the tide of global opinion is gradually, steadily shifting away from the position of the United, the, the position that the United States and Israel are taking. There's now growing unease, clearly in Europe. European governments no longer feel that they can simply veto or vote against resolutions of this nature. They're starting to abstain. And we see that 120 states supported this resolution. We still have a very long way to go. This is only, the, as I said, one resolution amongst many. It is non-binding. Israel, of course, has already made it clear that it is not going to abide by the terms of this resolution. The United States is not going to abide by the terms of this resolution. But it is a further marker of what is to come. Now, let me reiterate a point that I have made previously. At some point, we are going to see a big Israeli ground operation in Gaza, one intended to destroy Hamas. And we are also going to see the United States presumably do something in the Middle East. I'm completely unclear as of this time what that is, but there are strong reasons to think that it could involve some kind of strike against Iran, and at the very least against Iranian allies in the Middle East, perhaps Hezbollah. Now, the one thing that might derail this process in the United Nations is if this military action by Israel and possibly by the United States is successful. Now, again, here is the point where I struggle as somebody with no military background and with little knowledge of the fighters, the Hamas fighters, or of what they do. I don't know, as of this time, how successful or not this Israeli operation in Gaza is going to turn out to be. The Israelis are concentrating enormous forces against Gaza. They have extremely advanced weapon systems. They have enormously powerful bombs and 
um, bunker busting bombs. Um, they can undoubtedly if inflict tremendous damage upon Gaza and ultimately perhaps against Hamas as well. It might also be the case that Hamas is not the tough, resilient organization that um, we've all been led to think. And it could be, as has been pointed out to me, also by a uh, member of the Duran community who regularly writes to me about, about military matters, that communications, Hamas's communication system will ultimately break down, that Hamas will have difficulty coordinating the actions of its fighters, and that beyond every, anything else, because Gaza is now blockaded, unlike Hezbollah in Lebanon in 2006, it can't obtain reinforcements or fresh supplies. Its stocks of weapons will dwindle, and perhaps those stocks are not as great as I imagine them to be. And it could be that if we see a bigger operation by the United States in the Middle East, the United States, with all its enormous power, enormous military power, will be able successfully to achieve the what it wants to achieve in these operations. And at that point, as I said, all of these moves in the United Nations will lose steam and will become irrelevant. The United States at that moment will dictate terms, as will Israel. They will have shaped the situation on the ground and they will be able to, at least for a certain period of time, successfully say that they've achieved their objectives. But of course, all of this makes many assumptions about what will happen in military terms. And I have to say that my own sense is that the preponderant view, even within Israel itself, is that this is going to be a long, drawn-out, very difficult battle that um, Israel is likely to suffer significant losses, that um, Hamas is going to be able to put up a tough fight for itself, and as for U.S. military operations in the Middle East, and specifically any U.S. military operations against Iran, to be frank, I think that these run the risk not only of failing, but of failing catastrophically. In that case, the longer this goes on, the more the disaster that we see intensifies the more reports come out of Gaza, and they will come out of Gaza, despite whatever information blockade Israel wants to impose. And as I said, that information blockade might actually even exaggerate what is really happening in Gaza. The more reports from Gaza appear, the greater the international pressure is going to be the international pressure for not just a ceasefire, but for a general cessation of hostilities and for moves to set up a peace conference to uh, achieve a long, a durable settlement of the crisis in the Middle East. And obviously, the pressure, that pressure, will be focused principally in the United Nations. That will be the prime vehicle where that pressure will express itself diplomatically. But of course, it will also express itself in real terms. Now, Alistair Crook, who we were privileged to have do a program with us on the Duran some days ago, well, some weeks ago, actually, um, in which he described the early stages of this crisis. Anyway, he has also done what I think is another very insightful article about the situation at present. He says, he makes the point, and it's a correct point to make, and it's an obvious point to make, 
that if this, these events in the Middle East turn out unsuccessfully for the United States and for Israel, combined with the failures in Ukraine, about which more shortly, that will finally, and once and for all, confirm the feeling that we are witnessing a major decline in American power, that the United States not only is no longer the unipolar sole superpower, but that it is perhaps not even the most powerful superpower anymore, that it is no longer able to impose its will in the way that it historically could do. And Alistair Crook also says that the sentiment in the Middle East, which is, by the way, a far more sophisticated and well-educated place than it has been in the past. This is a fact which perhaps people in the West underestimate. Anyway, sentiment in the Middle East is not only crystallizing and hardening, but it is doing so to a degree and an extent which has not been the case historically in terms of the conflict, the various conflicts that have taken place between Israel and the Arab states. And Alistair Crook makes a really startling comparison. He says that in some respects, the tide of feeling in the Middle East, the sense that the Arabs are beginning to have of empowerment, but also of insurgency, of rebellion, not just against the, their own rulers, potentially, but against the system that the Western powers imposed on them, going perhaps back all the way to the period just directly after the end of the First World War. But this sense of defiance that the Arabs have, the closest, to, uh, the closest approximation to it is what happened in 1916 when Arab opinion finally turned decisively and conclusively against the Ottomans, who had been ruling this region since the 16th century, and leading to the Arab revolt of that time, which brought the Ottoman Empire in the Middle East, crashing to eventual to ultimate collapse. Now, I would say, and Alistair Crook has vastly more knowledge of the Middle East than I do, and is familiar with the languages, and with the people of the Middle East, to an extent that I, of course, am not, that we did have an earlier similar sort of awakening in the 1950s, following the coup that took place in 1952 in Egypt, and with the emergence of Gamal Nasser, and there were coups or revolutions in Iraq in 1958, and a crisis in Jordan, and moves in Syria to unite with Egypt, and a great deal happened was happening at that time. But I think it's fair to say that in the 1950s, the Arabs were far more divided amongst themselves than they are today. There was deep splits between the conservative monarchies in the Gulf and Nasser and his movement in Egypt. There were divisions over the fact that various Arab states and political movements were taking sides different sides in the Cold War. I think that this time, and this is why I think Alistair Crook is almost certainly right, I sense that there is much more of an Arab consensus, that the Arabs are much more united this time than they have ever previously been. And the fact that all of the Arab states apparently came together and sponsored 
this resolution, which we've just seen in the General Assembly, confirms as much. So, unless all of these military actions that the Israelis and the Americans may be contemplating succeed, and succeed within a finite period of time, then the potential for a geopolitical defeat, a major geopolitical defeat for the Western powers in the Middle East will grow with the global community perhaps ultimately successful in imposing a ceasefire on the United States and Israel on terms which neither side, neither of these two countries actually wants and in the alternative, perhaps an even worse outcome, an unimaginable disaster, a huge war between the United States and Iran, in which, as has been the case with so many recent wars, the United States not only fails to achieve its objectives, but comes away it feeling that it has been defeated, perhaps after a prolonged period, leading to a further crisis in the American system, the American-dominated system. And Alistair Crook makes a point, which I think is correct, that the Americans themselves sense the vastness of the stakes that they are playing for. They themselves are now showing clear signs of becoming nervous. I've discussed this in recent programmes. One can almost touch the unease. And this is probably partly what is explaining the uncertainties and the doubts and the inability to make clear statements about intentions and to dominate the diplomatic agenda in the way that the United States once did. I have to say that reading the language of the resolutions, the, the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, the statements made at that time by President Johnson and his officials, the self-confidence that the United States showed at that time, even if it was a self-confidence that ultimately proved to be misguided. But anyway, the enormous self-confidence, the belief that the United States, or at least the American leadership at that time, had in itself and in what it was going to do, what it could do, is in stark contrast to the much greater uncertainty that we're starting to see today. And it's not just Alistair Crook who's picking it up. There's a very strange, rather odd article in The Economist of all places today, in which it says that the Republican Party has lost conviction in American power. Now that is a curious thing to say. As I said, I don't actually agree with the point. I don't think that the Republicans have lost confidence in quite the way that the economist says. I think what is happening is that the United States, that the many Republicans are becoming increasingly hostile to forever wars and endless American interference around the world. I think what is actually happening is, as I said, that there is more nervousness within the US government altogether and within the US leadership about America's power altogether. But you could see the title of that article in The Economist, if not its content, as a recognition 
of the point that Alistair Crook is making, that America's self-belief, or at least the self-belief of America's leadership, of his neocon leadership, if you like, is now starting to falter. And though this is not going to deter them from doing whatever it is that they have resolved to do, for the first time, they're having serious doubts about him. Anyway, that is one crisis. There is, of course, the other crisis, which is the crisis in Ukraine. And here, by the way, we've had a slowdown in military news. We are now deeply into the time of the Rasputitsa. Apparently there's been heavy fog, heavy rain. Uh, the ground pretty much everywhere has now become soft and muddy. Um, it's become very difficult for either side to advance. And in light of all of that, there's been less news from the Ukrainian battlefronts. There is cascades of comments now, though, increasingly from Ukrainian sources, acknowledging a severe operational crisis, both in the Kupiansk, Oskol uh, uh, sector, and around Avdeevka. And one of the most interesting twists, developments, is apparently there's been a lot of concerns in Ukraine about very heavy losses in the Kupiansk Oskol sector. This has not been true until recently, but it does suggest that Russian attacks are indeed intensifying there. And I noticed that the Ukraini Ukrainian sources are now generally admitting Russian advances around Avdevka, that the Russians do indeed control the slag heap, that they are indeed starting to encroach on the Avdevka Coke factory, which makes coking coal, by the way, not Coca-Cola or anything like that, and that the communications lines to Avdevka are now at real risk of being severed. Now, here I'm going to take issue with one view that is being fairly widely expressed, um, including by some Ukrainians and by Simplicius the Thinker and others, that the fighting in Avdevka bears some resemblance to the fighting that took place in 2015 in the Balseva, when a Ukrainian force was surrounded by the Russians, um, causing negotiations, which, by the way, eventually led to the Minsk II agreement. I don't think there's any resemblance at all between the events in Avdeevka and the events in the Balseva. The Balseva was the product of a Ukrainian offensive carried out on a narrow front. The Ukrainian troops were able to advance, but it was an advance that led to them becoming almost surrounded and caused for them an operational crisis. This time, it's not the Ukrainians who've been trying to advance in the Avdeevka area. It is the Russians, and the Russians, moreover, are advancing against very heavily fortified Ukrainian positions, which was absolutely not the case in the fighting back in 2015 in the Balseva. Perhaps the only resemblance is that apparently, just as the road connections to the Ukrainian grouping in the Balseva became increasingly tenuous and dependent on one road, the same is beginning to look like it might eventually become true in Avdeevka as well. But we are not close to that point yet. But anyway, an operational crisis for the Ukrainians in Avdeevka, an operational crisis for the Ukrainians in the um, Kupiansk, the Kharkov sector, more reports of very heavy losses of Ukrainian manpower, there's admissions now that the U Russians hold around 10,000 Ukrainian prisoners, which I think 
is the is a record number. I might be wrong about that. And that Ukraine lacks Russian prisoners that it can exchange for those held in Russian ca captivity. And a recurrence of something that I remember happened earlier in the war when large numbers of protests took place in Ukraine connected with the heavy losses. The Ukrainian victories in the autumn of, 20, um, of 2022 stilled those protests. We, haven't, we didn't hear them for a long time. But now they're resuming and there is a, some polling evidence that President Zelensky's poll ratings are now falling and falling fast. Anyway, that's the situation on the battlefronts. I think that perhaps more interesting at the moment, given that we are in the time of the Rasputitsa, is to talk about the general um, logistical infrastructural situation. The European Union has now conceded that it is most unlikely to supply Ukraine with the one million shells it promised, which would arrive by March 2024. It's only supplied around 30% of the shells that it promised to Ukraine. Um, and it is most unlikely now, or so it seems, to meet the total. Um, it seems that um, Russian production of pretty much every item of equipment, by contrast, is spiking. The European Union is finding it all but impossible to increase its production of shells. Cost of production in the European Union of shells has increased from 2,000 euros per shell to 8,000 euros, which is a clear sign that production rates are not rising. Generally, if production increases, volumes of production rise beyond a certain point, then the cost of the cost per item actually falls instead of rising. The fact that the cost of shells in the European Union has quadrupled is a sign that production almost certainly is not rising and that there is therefore a massive shortage of shells to meet demand. Now, in the United States, the situation with shell production is said to be better, but I understand that overall the United States is also starting to run into similar problems in terms of increasing weapons production. And um, it's been suggested, there's been a long um, article, a long piece by, um, I understand, a military industrial economist who is suggesting that one of the problems is that there's been so much industry concentration in the United States, in the military industrial sector, that the Pentagon is now faced with problems of lack of competition amongst arms suppliers, which means that those arms suppliers are able, in effect, to dictate the price of whatever weapon system it is that they're being asked to supply. And I suspect that in terms of production of shells, this is going to be a particular problem, because by all accounts, production of shells is not a particularly profitable uh, uh, um, thing for the military-industrial complex in the United States to do. The unit cost of a shell is small, the profit margins are low, and given that we're talking about private companies, it's going to be actually much more difficult to achieve production targets. And to be frank, what I'm hearing makes me doubt that the United States is going to achieve its targets in terms of shell production at any point over the next few years.
Of course, all of this is going to be aggravated, as is now widely accepted. There's even been an article about this in The Hill, about the competing demands from Israel. Um, so, balancing supplies of weapons to Israel, Ukraine, Taiwan, and satisfying America's own needs is going to be extremely difficult. By contrast, the Russians have much more simple um, uh, supply issues. Their entire military industry is state-owned. It is largely operated by the gigantic state-owned Rostec Corporation. And we have... Well, the Russians can do things that the Americans can't. So we have uh, Shoigu, the Russian defense minister, this film with him visiting an ammunition production factory. And he's able to come out and say straightforwardly, uh, look, cut back a bit on your quality control, simplify your procedures. The priority now is not to get the very best shells, but to get the most shells. So you must increase production even more. And if you need to cut a few corners, well, we will live with that. Now, that is not something that it is easy to do in the United States and or, and, or in Europe. In fact, I'm going to suggest that it is all but impossible, given the regulatory burden in these countries, to do something of that nature. Now, all of that is happening alongside the enigma of North Korean supplies of weapons, uh, of, of shells. And we've told that North Korea has now apparently provided 350,000 shells to Russia, and that this is part of an overall order for 10 million shells. And we're also told that these shells are of modern production. And there's said to be pictures showing some of these shells now being operated by Russian artillery on the battlefronts. Now, I have discussed in the past difficulties about North Korean shells. Production quality has historically been low. I've heard of many reports, by the way, that North Korea has been choked of the... Um, necessary components to make shells, especially the necessary chemicals. I'm going to make a suggestion, and which I think perhaps might explain something of what is taking place, which is that I think that the Russians and the North Koreans might have been in contact with each other about North Korea increasing shell production for Russia back in the autumn of last year. North Korea does have large factories. It does have trained workers and disciplined workers. I think that the Russians might have reached some kind of an agreement with the North, with the North Koreans back then. I remember there were rumours already to that effect in the autumn of last year. I think that is perhaps when the agreements were reached. I think the Russians would have sent the necessary raw materials and components to North Korea at that time. I suspect that Russian officials, perhaps managers, went to the North Korean factories to ensure that they were organized in a way that would satisfy Russian needs. And it could be that the production that we are now seeing is actually uh, the, the shells that are, are now arriving in Russia from North Korea are the product of industrial decisions taken a year ago. And that would be logical. That would fit in fairly well with time frames. Now, one way or the other, it does look as if the Russians are getting many more shells to their soldiers than the Ukrainians are. In fact, it looks as if Ukrainian stockpiles of shells are actually dwindling, while Russian ones have been steadily increasing. Russians are increasing production for pretty much every type of weapon system that they have been that they have needed to use on their battlefronts.
And it's widely acknowledged now that Russian missile production, cruise missile production, has also been increasing. But as the British Ministry of Defence has pointed out, whilst the Russians continue to carry out drone attacks across Ukraine pretty much every night, whilst they're supplementing these drone attacks with attacks by um, um, powerful air-to-ground missiles and ballistic missiles, and also um, with, uh, um, with uh, bombs, um, aerial bombs, they have not launched cruise missiles from their strategic bombers for around a month. And the speculation is that the Russians are building up a stockpile for some purpose. There's worries about a major Russian offensive against Ukraine's energy system. But of course, it could be that the Russians are stockpiling missiles whose production apparently has doubled to target something else. Well, at some point, no doubt, we will find out. Now, I have also spoken about the fact that Russian, the Russians have been claiming in recent weeks to have destroyed very large numbers of Ukrainian fighter jets, um, around 31 aircraft, um, according to the Russian Defense Ministry, since the start of October. Fighter jets, indeed, the way it's described, it's almost a massacre in the skies. And the Russians have given an explanation. It's been done with S-400 long-range missiles operating um, alongside uh, Russian AWACS aircraft, the Beriev A-50s. And it is also, by the way, the case that the Russians seem to be increasingly su successful for the moment shooting down Ukrainian cruise missiles. We're hearing less about Ukrainian cruise missile attacks again. But it also turns out that over the last two weeks, there's been a sudden surge, sudden spike in Russian claims of destruction of Ukrainian artillery. And um, reports have been piling up of more and more Ukrainian artillery systems being destroyed. And the assumption, the widespread assumption, is that this is being done by mo mostly by drones, Russian drones, suicide drones, operating now over the skies of Ukraine, becoming increasingly sophisticated and having increasingly longer range and being able, therefore, to destroy uh, Ukrainian artillery pieces um, in ever larger numbers. So, a deteriorating situation for Ukraine. The situation on the battlefronts is at a standstill because of weather conditions, but there is for Ukraine an operational crisis in Avdeevka, an operational crisis in the north, in Kharkov region, Ukraine's manpower reserves are dwindling. Its material losses are growing. And Russian material equipment positions appear to be in, in, increasing, improving. Now, is there any good news for Ukraine? Well, some people are pointing out to the fact that the Russian Central Bank has increased interest rates again from 13% to 15%, more than some people expected. And indeed, the governor of the Russian Central Bank, Elvira Nabulina, has said that she has no option but to do this because inflation rates continue to be higher than she had anticipated. And it is indeed the case that interest rates in Russia have doubled over the last couple of months. They were for a long time at 7.5%. They're now at 15%. Very high interest rates indeed. And that is going to have an impact eventually on the Russian economy. It is intended to slow down its runaway growth at the moment.
Now, I have so, uh, seen some suggestions being made that the reason that the central bank is being forced to increase interest rates and for the higher inflation in Russia is that so much production is now being committed, so much of industry is now being committed to, in, to military production, that this is what is causing a general shortage of goods in the civilian sectors, and that it is this shortage of goods that is causing a lack of demand, uh, a lack of supply, and which is leading generally to higher prices. Now, I hang, I'm going to push back against that. I follow Russian industry news rather more closely than some of the people who've been saying this do. And I do not know of a single sector of the industrial economy, the civilian industrial economy, where there has been any kind of reduction in civilian production. On the contrary, all parts of the industrial sector are rushing to increase production to, fill, to fulfill exploding demand. There are problems with imports, Russia has still not fully replaced all of the imports that it used to, all the goods that it, you know, all the imports that it used to have from the West with imports sourced from other third country suppliers. So there is still that problem. But I don't think that these problems, the increase, for example, in food prices, especially, which Russia being a major food producer. I do think that these, this problem with higher prices in Russia, inflation in Russia, is caused by problems in production, in, in the manufacturing industry, caused by diversion of factories towards military production. I think it's the product of surging demand. The Russian economy saw uh, limited demand during the period of the pandemic. That has been true of pretty much all economies. So savings built up then. And savings also built up last year because after the imposition of the sanctions, people were too frightened to spend. And I remember last year, this time last year, there were worries in Russia. The demand was so low that it might even re lead to deflation in the economy. And the government and the central bank for many, many months worked overtime to increase demand, to increase wages, to uh, uh, cause people to spend in order to avoid deflation and to get the economy moving again. And it seems to me that what we've seen is a classic case of the Russian authorities, especially the monetary authorities, the central bank, in other words, getting a lot more than they bargained for. In the uh, second quarter of this year, demand suddenly exploded. People suddenly discovered that they had money in their bank accounts, that the economy was not about to implode, that they, were, they had money to spend and they went out and spent it, and that has caused a huge surge in spending, which has led to higher prices. And if you read carefully what Nabulina is saying, she's making precisely that point. She says that the tightening of monetary policy ha it will eventually have an effect, but the effect, there's always, there's always a lag. And at the moment, what is most, having most effect on the way in which the economy is operating, on the contrary, were the stimulus measures that the government and the central bank took last year. So I think eventually all this is going to, right itself and balance itself out. I think all of these steps that Nabulina is taking now, which are very typical of her, by the way, she never does things by halves, um, will eventually 
uh, have the effect of slowing demand down and bringing things back into balance. I don't think this is going to impact on production in the military sector at all. And I don't think this is going to pose any significant constraints on what the Russians are going to be doing in the area of their special military operation. So there we go. Um, a crisis in Ukraine, developing crisis in Ukraine. I don't think people in the West have yet fully understood how grave the situation in Ukraine for Ukraine is becoming. Lots of uncertainties about the situation in the Middle East. But already a defeat for the United States in the General Assembly. So this is where I end today's video. More from me soon. Let me repeat again that you can find all our programs on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble and X. You can also support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar and by going to our shop, links under this video. And last but not least, if you've liked this program, please remember to check your subscription to this channel and to tick the like button. And that's where I end today. More from me soon and have a very good day.